I'm Chad Main, the founder of Legal Services Company Percipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, legal innovation, and the impact tech is having on the law. On today's show, I have a conversation with Dan Rabinowitz. He's an attorney and the founder of Predicta. That's a company that uses data science for judicial analytics. My conversation today is with a former big law lawyer turned tech entrepreneur, Dan Rabinowitz. After stints with law firms, the DOJ, and time as general counsel, Dan's going to tell us how all that led to the founding of Predicta. Predicta is an app that uses data science to tackle judicial analytics. But unlike a lot of software out there, Predicta doesn't just look at the judge's opinion and track record. It looks at other factors that influence the judge's decision, like a judge's net worth, a judge's political affiliation, their educational work experience, along with other biographical data points. You may have read about Predicta recently in the legal tech press because it just bought Gavalytics. That's another judicial analytics company founded by Rick Merrill, who's also been a guest in the show way back in 2018. Predicta was originally focused on federal courts, but by joining forces with Gavalytics, the company got a trove of info about state court judges and opinions. But Dan's not just all about judicial analytics. Before we get into Predicta, tell me a little bit about Deco Cocktails. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) So I have a number of varied interests, if you will. Uh, And one of them is uh, cocktails, alcohol. I'm with you. I'm with you. There you go. And for many years, I've been doing cocktails. I've been making it for my friends. We have like a weekly get together where I do cocktails and just have a good time. And my partner, who also loves cocktails but cannot make cocktails, always had this dream of producing ready to drink or ready to sip, as we like to refer to ours, cocktails. (laughs) And uh, he approached me. He's in real estate. I'm a lawyer. And he called me and he called me up. He's like, hey, I have this great idea. And I'm like, we don't really have much in alignment here. <laughs> like, no, we both love drinking. And uh, <laughs> so we have started this company and we produce these uh, really beautifully done, I think, uh, bottled cocktails. We're actually in the process of revamping our formulation and our, and our bottling and uh, marketing and uh, labeling. I'm actually going out to L.A. and three or four weeks from now to talk with a new manufacturer. And essentially what we're looking to do is recreate the craft bar scene at home. So you can't get out or you're not interested in getting out, but we want to produce a cocktail of that quality, that complexity in a bottle that also evokes that like great cocktail experience where you're like, you're in a bar, it's like, you know, beautiful mahogany, great bartender and uh, so on. So that's really what we're looking to bring to the home consumer. Where can we buy it now? Is it just in the DMV there in the DC area? Or? So right now, technically, it's direct to consumer. We've sold out our first run, and now we are transitioning to a larger producer. And then we hope to uh, get through both uh, D to C, a, a direct to consumer, as well as to get into normal uh, distribution channels. So where are you located? Chicago. Okay. So hopefully we will be there at some point in time. I can't say that's our first market. But at the very least, you'll be able to order um, online probably in the next three to four months. Well, I digress because this is technically legal. It's not technically liquor. But when and why did you want to become a lawyer? When in life I wanted to become a lawyer? I think pretty early on, I want to say. Probably a stupid decision to make so early in life. Set <laughs> yourself up for that. But probably pretty early on, I, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. There was this guy I knew who was a, who was a litigator. And you know he was always sort of a model for me. And uh, always wanted to do that. Whether or not that's the best thing to decide when you're like nine <laughs> years old is uh, another conversation, I guess. Do you come from a family of lawyers? No, not at all. My uh, dad is a truck driver. My mother worked for Social Security for many years. And my grandfather was a rabbi. So not really uh, in that vein. Yeah, not, not a lot of lawyers there. Not so a lot of lawyers. You go to Georgetown, then you go to Big Law, right? You go to Sidley? Yeah, I went to Sidley, uh, did big law for five years or so, did trial and appellate work, some product stuff, some white collar, and then Sidley has actually one of the premier uh, Supreme Court practices, so I got to do some work uh, around that. The way I like to refer to it is I was at the bottom of the list, which meant I actually wrote the brief. (laughs) Went to DOJ, also got to do trial and appellate work, mainly government contracts, but also we actually had a Supreme Court brief as well as I I was involved in. What type of stuff we do to the DOJ? What were the issues? So we were mainly focused on government contracts. So that was a lot of stuff having to do with the FAR, 
which controls uh, government contracts. We also did some uh, fraud because we had the opportunity to file a fraud counterclaim. So we had a couple of trials that fraud was involved. And then also we handled certain cases in front of the federal circuit, mainly having to do with uh, federal employees' uh, benefits. We also handled those at the federal circuit level. But that was probably the bulk of what we did. We, I also did, I also worked for a period of time on um series of litigation having to do with spent nuclear fuel. So essentially the trash that's produced in the production of uh, nuclear energy. So the government in the early 80s signed contracts with all the nuclear um, power producing uh, companies that they agreed to take all their trash. Now, before they signed those, they did not identify or they, or they didn't really identify where they're going to put all those. Nonetheless, all the utilities paid them. And then the government, when they went to go ahead and collect it, needless to say, none of the states, none of the municipalities were really interested in having nuclear <laughs> waste in their backyard. So that's where like Yucca Mountain came in, where they attempted to put it. And until today, they still have not found a location to go ahead and put it in or to uh, deal with the um, spent nuclear fuel. And as a consequence, the utilities sue more or less every five years or so to get damages because they've had to house the nuclear waste on their own sites and that has a cost associated with it so you go in-house ultimately booz allen i assume it's the government connection there you have that background that's how you get in there yeah we had a government background um i ended up doing internal investigations the first major investigation i did was the, the edward snowden investigation he was a booz allen contractor that uh, yes uh, fairly relevant in light of the fact of again another major leak of uh, government confidential or, or secret information, mainly focused on, as I said, uh, internal investigations, but also there was exposed a bit to systems and corporate systems and also the ability, aside from what my previous experience had been in terms of systems, mainly like e-discovery and the like. So spent a couple of years there and then went to a small data analytics company where I then had the opportunity to be exposed to a number of data analytics platforms that they operated, mainly in the intelligence community. Some of them you may have heard of, the, I think the most well-known is Palantir, other platforms as well that they serviced. And sort of there was the kernel that there must be a better way, if there's a better way to do you know, uh, intelligence, if there's a better way to look at those sorts of problems and issues, there has to be a better way to operate in the law. And more particularly, you know, in the law, you spend all this time on fact research, brief writing, crafting arguments, you know, uh, mooting that, working through all the nuances of it. But as we know today, let's just take a pretty straightforward uh, example that's in the news. You could have the exact same facts, the exact same law, and a judge in Washington state rules one way, and a judge in Texas rules the other way. So how do you account for that variation? So you've advised your client, look, here are the facts. We've spent, you know, months, if not years, going through documents, interviewing people internally, looking at the law that's, that's relevant here, all the legal issues. But then how do you account for the person that ultimately is going to make the decision whether or not your argument is compelling, whether or not your ar argument carries the day? And again, it isn't so much having to do with the particular argument. You know, everyone makes great arguments. Everyone has done, you know, phenomenal research. Everyone has written the, the best brief that they possibly can. But how do you assess what that actually will mean in the real world? That is, the judge, how is she going to be affected by who the lawyers are, who the parties are, and so on? How do you account for that? And therefore, how do you advise your clients and how do you assess strategy and the like? You're at the data analytics company. Yes. And you're thinking about this. You're thinking about this. What was your role at the data analytics company? I was the general counsel, but I guess this is sort of where the kernel was, where I was brought in to be general counsel, but also to try to understand how they might leverage the technologies that they had access to in the intelligence side, mainly, and how they might leverage those and implement those in the legal space. So the idea, if you will, that you could take commercially available technology or commercial approaches to technology and apply those in the legal sphere. But how did they want to, if they're an intelligence company, how did they want to employ that in the legal sphere? So they actually didn't know. They just had an idea. They had worked on a particular investigation, which I can't get into. Right. And they had used and leveraged some of the technology that they had access to for a particular investigation. So they had the idea that, hey, you know, we have all these platforms that we operate on. Is there any way that we can expand our business line to not only include the federal government and you know others, banks and the like? Can we also embrace the legal community? Is there anything that we can bring to the table for them? So then fast forward, 
your wheels are turning. This is where the idea for predicta comes into play. Like, when is this? What, what time are you, are you starting to think, well, maybe this is a company I can create? Yeah. So at that point in time, I understand and appreciate that big data has a number of use cases. You know, at that point in time, you know, I'm working there. I eventually transitioned to a healthcare company where I'm able to leverage both my analytic background as well as my legal background because we're creating a anti-fraud technology that has both a um, technology component to it, but also there was a government interface component. So with DOJ, we were part of Anthem Healthcare. We were an entity that was created. It was called uh, WellPoint uh, Military Care. It's a bid on the second largest government contract. And needless to say, the second largest government contract because of the United States and all its awesomeness <laughs> is healthcare. Yeah. It isn't, you know, guns or, you know, art- artillery. It's uh, healthcare. So we were tasked with creating a, a bid and proposal for that. And there were th- two or three other competitors. And ultimately, we did not win that contract. So eventually, the unit was spun down. And I was offered, you know, it was closed down and I had to exit that. What year was this? I'd have to check, but I want to say 2016, maybe. What's the official creation date of Predicta? Maybe it was 2018, because I think the official uh, creation date was 2019 of Predicta. The unit shut down. You get some time off, start thinking about it. And it's during that time frame, you say, hey, I'm going to pursue this. Yeah taking data and applying it to legal analysis of specifically of judges and, and courts and stuff. At that point in time, I was trying to consider like, do I go back to the law? Do I go back to a firm? Do I go back to in-house or, or the like? And I started thinking about this particular idea about analyzing uh, judges. I live in DC and, you know, every other person that you talk to is, is a lawyer. And I was like, okay, maybe I could do something different here. Maybe I could look at the law, take my experience, and go in a different direction. And um, my partner, who has a deep experience in the financial industry, he's one of the earliest ETFs, and he had been very successful in that. And now he sort of was looking for other opportunities. And I had reached out to him, frankly, just as a sounding board for whether or not this made sense, how I could potentially go ahead and uh, raise capital in order to create the company and then move forward. And after I met with him a couple of times, he actually said to me, hey, put together a proposal. I think this is something that I might be interested in uh, joining. And that's ultimately how uh, we linked up. So he was bringing the capital. He was bringing some of the, you know, sort of cutting edge experience, working in industries that were sort of um, emerging. And from there, you know, we had sufficient capital to go ahead and... Did you raise money or was it your business partner had enough sufficient capital? It's just my business partner and myself. So you're quote unquote bootstrapped, quote unquote. Correct. <laughs> we are bootstrapped. We have not had to raise um, any additional capital throughout this process. Although it has been, as you would imagine, you know, incredibly time intensive yep. as well as from, from a financial perspective, we've been able to, to just do this uh, between the two of us. And what was it about entrepreneurship that tilted the scales that way versus going back to the law? You know, at the end of the day, I met a lot of great lawyers. I thought that I had a unique proposition for the industry. So rather than just being another, I would like to think, although I can't promise another great lawyer out there, let's bring something new that hasn't been done before. Let's come into the space of analyzing judges and let's come into the space, not simply through like uh, backwards looking uh, statistics that just gather up data. Let's actually, and this is one of the things that really um, was impressed upon me when I was at the data analytics firm and they were working for the intelligence community, that like you could use data not simply backwards looking, but forwards looking. So in that instance, as you would imagine, a lot of their work or a lot of what the federal government does without speaking to you know the particulars, they were trying to determine what people will do. Who is going to be an issue? Where are the issues going to arise? Who are the actors and the entities that we need to worry about? What are their linkages? What can we glean from what they've done in the past to where they're going in the future? And that's really where the value add is. The value add is not simply, you know, surfacing statistics. It's understanding the value of those statistics and then using big data, machine learning, and AI in order to take it to the next level and understand, well, what can we predict future behavior with using all that information when we come back dan gets into the nitty-gritty about predicta tells us about how it works and what's on the roadmap i'm chad main and you're listening to technically legal this podcast is brought to you by percipient a legal services company powered by technology 
Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. Let's get back to my conversation with predictive founder, Dan Rabinowitz. You run into somebody on the street or the coffee shop and they ask what you do. I'm a lawyer and I'm an entrepreneur. I start a company called Predicta. What do you tell them? We do judicial analytics that enables us using both historical data as well as biographical and demographic data in order to predict how a judge will rule on your case, the specifics of your case. What will influence them? The lawyers, the parties, the fact that that's an individual suing a large company represented by a big firm, a small firm, plaintiff's firm, publicly traded company how that will affect the decision maker. Just like all of us are affected by any number of factors as as we people, and we make uh, split second decisions about those, how does that transfer and relate to judges? And once you understand that, it becomes this exercise in predicting what they will do next. And specifically on your website, you say, we use data science to predict whether cases survive a motion dismissed by identifying factors that influence such a decision, including the judge's net worth, political affiliation, educational work experience, and other biographical data. How and where do you get that information? So it's a variety of uh, different sources. I can say with absolute uh, faith that we do not hire private investigators (laughs) ahead and surveil uh, federal judges or state court judges. Instead, much as you would imagine with regard to, you know, us as civilians, if you will, there's a lot of information that's publicly available and we cull from those sources and we create our own proprietary database that includes information, biographical, historical, career about federal judges that then we incorporate into our model. So every federal judge right now, and we can talk about the Gavalytics acquisition in a bit, every federal judge has a unique biographical profile that's created from those multiple data sources. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about the nuts and bolts. It's 2019, you got your business partner set, you got some money. What's the first thing you do? How do you develop this? How do you create the model? How do you create the technology? Yeah, so I had the idea that if we could marry up, if you will, past performance with the human being, we could go ahead and predict how that human being will rule based upon the case specifics. So would you say past behavior, you're you're talking about, okay, we've got a motion to dismiss based on form non-convenes or whatever it is, and they've ruled X percent of the time. What are you looking at? So let's actually take it to a higher level. We don't want to necessarily look at the individual because when you're operating under the concepts of big data or data analytics, what you're really trying to do is to take the individual and divide them into multiple pieces. So for example, I am Dan Rabinowitz. I live outside of DC, I'm a lawyer, I live on a particular street, I have a particular net worth, my neighbors are so-and-so, and And all those factors, I have a postgraduate degree, you know, I'm married, and all these things are now Dan Rabinowitz. So essentially, Dan Rabinowitz is, is a huge spreadsheet of a variety of characteristics. So those characteristics then enable us to see the person and put them in buckets, in other buckets. So what we want to understand is not necessarily who the lawyer is specifically or who the plaintiff is specifically. We want to understand who they are from a classification perspective. So is it a corporation? Is it a publicly held corporation? Is it on the S&P? Is it in the financial industry? So now what we can do is we can take something that is simply text, right? JP Morgan Chase, that's just text. But we want to then take that and compare JP Morgan because JP Morgan's a lot like Wells Fargo. It's a lot like other financial operators. So the benefit of that is, is now we're not looking at just cases with JP Morgan Chase. We're looking now at the universe of all cases that involve financial institutions that are publicly traded. So that opens the aperture to now include a whole lot of cases that have been litigated across the country, maybe in front of that particular judge. So that's really what the way that we want to approach this is sort of back out of that. And this is one of the the limitations of a lot of the current data analytics, where if you want to get down super granular and you want to say, well, how is Dan or how is his law firm at winning? 
The problem is, is and I experienced this, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is not unique, but when we had a case, there would be the firm-wide email that went out. Yeah. And the firm-wide email would say, okay, we're in front of Judge Smith. Yep. Has anyone else been in front of Judge Smith? Our, our client really wants to know. And inevitably, you'd have someone say, she was really tough on us yeah. as plaintiffs. Now, what, yeah. now what they don't say is, is that they were an AUSA in a criminal case. Right, okay? right. And that has no relationship to the contract dispute between two major corporations. So the way to get to that is by understanding those classifications and categories. And that enables you to sort of pull back and capture a lot more data and then to understand patterns and trends. So what we do when we're looking at historic data, essentially when it comes to a motion to dismiss. So judges write opinions in fewer than 2% of all their motions to dismiss. So if you're just deciding, hey, I want to see what this judge is going to do. Let me look at their opinions. You're ignoring 98% of what they actually rule on. So then you say, okay, fine. So let me look at the decisions. So those decisions are those one sentence orders, right? I hereby grant, I hereby deny. And there are a number of platforms that provide that backwards looking historic data. And they say, you know, 67% of the time, Judge Smith dismisses cases. And then you can drill down one level and you can say, well, 72% of securities cases, Judge Smith grants those motions to dismiss. But if those 72%, if all those securities cases that she heard were individuals suing their brokers and you're representing to go back to the case we were talking about before, Wells Fargo, and they're suing Chase, most of those have no relatives, right? So how do you then account for those cases? So what we do is we look at those decisions that are just the grants and denials, and we enrich that data by understanding who the parties are, who the attorneys are, who represents who, was it an individual suing a large corporation, was it a regional firm that was representing the individual, was it a plaintiff side firm, a normal one, was it an AMLA 100 on the other side? So now we've taken those one sentence orders, and we now have much, much more information about those one sentence orders. It was when an individual was suing a large corporation represented by a solo practitioner on the other side was an AMLA 100 firm. And then the beauty of our system is it then starts looking for patterns within that information. So those yays and nays, those grants and denials are now turned into a much richer data set. And that's how we're able to then to your question about like, how do we get like a, you know, the particular type of motion or the particular type of law? Frankly, and, I, and from a lawyer perspective, I find this somewhat, I don't want to say frustrating, but certainly disappointing that we don't care about what the precedent is. I don't care if Twombly came out and 12B6 motions are treated differently than, than they used to be before, or it's forum non-convenient, or, or whatever the reason or the rationale or the argument that the lawyer articulated as to why the motion to dismiss should be granted. Instead, it's these non-obvious patterns that are much more telling if you want to, to arrive at a prediction. That's interesting. I'm oversimplifying here, but I, I take it, you take a particular judge, particular motion, and you got attributes, and you're just like filling in the blanks. Like, all right, is it a big company? Yes. Is it, you know, are a foreign defendant? No. Attributes like that. And then that's what the analysis is conducted on. So that's the first half. Yes, that's exactly what the first half. The second half is now we want to understand the human being. So now let's look at the demographic and characteristics of that particular judge. Where did she go to undergrad? Where did she go to law school? Where did she practice? Was she a state court judge before she was elevated to the federal bench? Net worth, you know, geography, all these other pieces that go into making us human. That's the other piece that we need to combine with that historic data. Because a lot of this information is public record because they got to disclose a lot of it, right? Correct. Especially the financial stuff, except for the Supreme Court justices, but that may change. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. But it's really the combination of the biography and what they've done in the past, understanding that you have to look beyond the simple yeas and nays. That's what enables us to get to that highly accurate prediction. The way I like to think of it, in some regard, the way that Google is able to predict whether or not we're going to be interested in a trip, we're going to go somewhere or buy something. It's probably not because they're listening into us, although that's always a possibility. But you know how like <laughs> when you're thinking about something and then the ad pops up, the reason they're able to do that is because they have seen our past buying habits, right? They've looked at our past buying habits and then they know information about us personally, right. that personal data. So it's that combination of those two pieces of what we've done in the past as it relates to buying a 
uh, a TV or whatever it might be, or a judge deciding a particular motion, as well as understanding the, the biographical features and how they live their life, what street they live on, you know, who their neighbors are, et cetera. That's how Google is able to make a, you know, many billions of dollars business out of their advertising. And it's sort of the same concept that we're using to predict judges, preferences, and rulings in the future. Predictive starts is focused on federal court. Fast forward to this year, you acquire Gavalytics. So Gavalytics, Rick Merrill started it a few years ago, had a good run, then kind of shut the doors. And then like a phoenix, you guys come together and you combine forces. So tell me about that. What interested you? How'd you guys get together? How did this all start? So Rick obviously was a pioneer in the judicial analytics space. I mean, he was one of the early ones to understand the, the value of looking at what a judge has done in the past. And in particular, you know, he attacked the challenge of state court data, which is highly complex and very, very difficult. It's a very difficult not to correct. Every state and then every jurisdiction within a state has its own, you know, uh, court record, uh, system of record for the courts, how to get that data where that data resides and how to process it and all the challenges that, that come with it. Rick created great technology as well as a great interface in order to surface that and allow attorneys access to that information. Rick being someone in the space, when I launched, Rick actually uh, reached out to me just to you know say, hey, great idea. This is a space that's really ripe for innovation. And then he, I think it was a couple of days afterwards, he, you know, had to shut down Gavalytics. And in, in the early conversations with him, you know, I have been, you know, while we initially focused on federal data that were federal courts and federal judges, while that's a huge amount of information, it's over 700 judges. At the same time, obviously for us, we always had an interest in moving into state courts. Nonetheless, in terms of starting a company, you first try to crack the uh, first level. And in my discussions with Rick, you know, I saw this as a terrific opportunity for us to obtain the state court data that he had worked so long on, uh, scraping, processing, and then pulling it all together. And of course, he was interested in, while well, Gabalytics didn't work out in the end, but the idea that all that work that he'd done, all that heavy lifting could then be used for an entirely different application, you know. What Gavalytics did was essentially, I, and this is the way I think that Rick articulated it to me, which I find very compelling, which is Gavalytics was essentially an almanac, right? It, it told you what the weather patterns had been and then, you know, what you might anticipate from them. What we do is forecast it. We tell you two weeks out whether or not it's going to rain. Now, the way we're able to do that is using the data such as the data that Rick and, and Gavalytics had collected. But this is, you know, two or three steps beyond where Gavalytics was. So the idea that we could leverage all that work and then not only just simply reproduce it, that is just turn back on Gavalytics, but take that data and really using it in a more meaningful way. Because, of course, to go back to the earlier discussion about how, you know, if you're looking at, you know, 72% of cases, a judge grants those when it comes to securities cases, but without understanding the underlying issues as it relates to those, again, was it Wells Fargo or was it individuals suing their uh, brokers that really can't help you when you're looking to predict, right? If you're interested, if you will, in an academic exercise to like what the judge has done in the past, great. But if you want to answer the question, which every lawyer wants to know, which is what is the judge going to do with their case? The way to get there is to take data like Rick had and then work through it the way that we have create the predictive models and so on. And then you can arrive at the answer to that question, what the judge will do with your case, with the motion that you filed. Is it a matter of normalizing the data? Because I assume what Rick was doing for state court and Gavalytics was collecting different data points. Oh, there was overlapping, I'm sure. But you're collecting some different stuff. I mean, like, you know, where a judge went to school and how much the judge is worth. Has there been some growing pains trying to normalize that information? So I would actually say less growing pains and more opportunity for us because we had a slightly different focus than Rick and Gavalytics and Rick had his particular focus. One of the things that we've been really excited to learn is during this integration process, we've created a much richer data set than either of us had beforehand. Right. Number of things that we're contemplating doing in the future, but that has really enabled us to look in a very different direction because of the two data sets being natively different or having different folk guide, in other words, that they're looking to do something very different. The combination really produces, if you will, a beautiful stepchild. <laughs> well, no, it's a child, right? It's not a stepchild. You guys are married. It's a child. 
Again, you guys aren't remarried. It's a new kid. So what's on the roadmap? What's the initial plan? What are short-term goals, long-term goals? Sure. So we have both um, near-term and longer-term. So in the near term, you know, the major driving force in purchasing and acquiring Gavalytics and its data is to take our same philosophy that we've applied to federal judges and apply that to state court judges. So to provide predictions. Now, our limitation right now is, is that, or not necessarily limitation, but our, our first, you know, sort of area that we've decided to tackle is motions to dismiss. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but the idea, number one, on our product timeline is to move beyond motion citizens, whether that be summary judgment or expert motions, but to start looking up. After- right. I was just about to say that because you can kind of get some pretty important information from that motion to dismiss. I mean, a judge is less likely to dismiss a case. You know, he's going to give it a few times, right? But you, there's going to be some good indications there of like how that judge leans come summary judgment time and how to apply that info. Exactly. So there are other opportunities for us to, to push this out well beyond the motion to dismiss. So that's one sort of on a timeline. The uh, second piece, and this goes back to the more robust data set that that we've been able to create by the integration of the Gavalytics with ours, and that is to the extent that we can't necessarily immediately get to a prediction, we are able to offer more tailored statistics. Meaning, again, to go back to this, you know, I don't mean to harp on it, but but the Wells Fargo versus uh, JP Morgan Chase. So let's say we haven't reached the point where we can provide a prediction about summary judgment. But at least if you're looking at the statistics for summary judgment, you want to know what the judge does with similar financial institutions in summary judgment. So that information we are going to be able to provide also in the near term. So in other words, these more case-specific, case-tailored statistics is also an area that we are going to uh, go ahead and uh, roll out. Now, I should back up because I think one of the areas that I didn't get to touch on yet, and it's a really important point or really important capability that we have, is we are not only able to do this after a judge is assigned. So, of course, being judge-focused, we look at the judge, we look at the particulars of the case, and then we can determine how the judge will go ahead and rule on the motion to this. We are, if you will, agnostic about the facts and the law. Now, before a case is filed, there are three unknowns. Or a complaint, you don't know the facts, you don't know the law, and you also don't know who the judge is, right? So if you're filing a case, you're sort of left to that anecdotal, you know, hey, I practice in front of this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction is more favorable to plaintiffs or more favorable to defendants or whatever it might be. Well, of course, all that, in most instances, the data actually doesn't bear any of that out, but like we like to think that, that we know how all this happens, but the reality is we don't. So what we're able to do is, of course, the facts in the law, less important to us. But we want to know who the parties are and who the attorneys are. And then, of course, in terms of the judges, so what we do is we look at a jurisdiction and we say, okay, we'll analyze every judge within the jurisdiction. And then we'll give you an overall jurisdiction score as well as the each individual judge because ultimately it will be assigned to a judge. So then what it enables both plaintiffs to do as well as others, and I'll get to a, a very interesting uh, use case that we just had with, with a client. It enables them to say, hey, should I file in this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction? Because this jurisdiction, I have a much better chance of surviving a motion to dismiss. And of course, on plaintiff's side, the major gate or the major hurdle to get through in order to talk about settlement and where to get to anything else is surviving a motion to dismiss. So we can do that analysis even before a case is filed. Now, that's one application in, in terms of, you know, on the plaintiff's side. Now, on the defense side, we actually had this uh, client approach us, and they had a case in the Southern District of Florida, and they were in front of a judge already, and they had filed a motion to dismiss. And we looked at the judge, and we said, hey, the judge is not going to grant you a motion to dismiss. This is going to go to discovery. It's going to cost you millions of dollars in discovery fees, and then, of course, in terms of sell. But they said, we had an opportunity to transfer venue. We can transfer to the Central District of California. Our chances better. And we looked at it, and we said, in fact, your chances are much better. Oh, well, interesting. California. So you could go ahead and we could run that analysis, even though the case hasn't been filed in the central district, but we can go ahead and also run the same predictive analytics and understand each judge in the central district, as well as the overall likelihood in that particular jurisdiction in order to arrive at a prediction that you can safely, if you will, rely upon to make that decision. Should we file a transfer motion or not? How do organizations subscribe to the product? Is it subscription-based? Is it project-based? Is it ad hoc? How does it work? So the way it works is, from our perspective, it's a one and done for each case, right? So you run our analysis for a case, 
And the only information that you need to provide our system, and, and this is a critical point, and I picked up from the time that I was practicing law, as a lawyer, you don't have enough time to do whatever you already have to do. So overlaying an additional piece of technology in an area that there's frankly no way for you to effectively analyze, that is the judge, you're not a data scientist, you're not a statistician. So what we didn't want to give you is more numbers, more stuff for you to go ahead and parse and analyze and try to determine its relevance. So the only information that you need to feed to the system is the case number. We don't require you to upload your briefs. We don't require you to upload any facts. It's simply the case number, and then we provide the prediction. And once you input that case number, we go ahead, provide the predictive prediction, and then you understand how the judge is going to rule in your case. So it is not a user base. It's not a time-based system. It's simply, it's charge per case. And our pricing model is simply an annual subscription with, we have three different tiers based on the number of cases that you ultimately subscribe to. Dan, I appreciate your time. If people want to learn more about Predicta, they want to subscribe, they want to reach out to you, where do you want to send them? Just the website, pre-dicta.com. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.